Welcome to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Mike Lim Hotel. It is Sunday, June 27th, 2021, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well today. It's been a very busy day. We know state of emergency has been declared in Detroit by Governor Gretchen Whitmer because of massive flooding that's taking place. Um, and you know, Comcast uh, Xfinity was out uh, yesterday and uh, part of yesterday, part of Saturday, part of Sunday, came back on Sunday. It came back on Saturday afternoon and it was off this morning when I got back up and uh, came back on sometime this afternoon. So it's been uh, causing a problem with me getting work done and preparing for the shows as well. But, um, you know, we persevere. So last Sunday, we were not on live because I was in Atlanta uh, for the ninth annual uh, Juneteenth uh, Parade and Music Festival. And, you know, I've talked to a lot of people down there. I did two presentations uh, dealing with uh, the history of Juneteenth uh, at the festival. And I was interviewed on Friday, uh, June 18th. I was interviewed uh, by uh, Angela Matthews of the uh, Urban Interest Show on um, uh, Urban Information Network. And we talked about some of the history of Juneteenth uh, and why uh, the Juneteenth federal holiday, uh, Juneteenth being made a federal holiday, why that is, why that can be something very powerful for African Americans. It can be a very, it can be a very powerful weapon for us to use if we know how to use it properly. Just like any weapon, you have to be trained on how to use it. So I'm gonna share that interview that she did with me. We dealt with a lot of history. And as I said before, Juneteenth ties into the fight over uh, voting rights and the voter restriction bills that are being passed in Republican dominated state legislatures. It deals with economic empowerment. It deals with the Fight for Land, the Black Farmers, uh, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. It deals with the fight for reparations, um, what happened after slavery, Reconstruction, Jim Crow era, Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896, Mississippi State Constitution, 1890. Uh, all that deals with uh, Juneteenth. OK, unfortunately, a lot of people I see a lot of misinformation. Being circulated uh about juneteenth and i can tell you know people didn't do any research so we're going to deal with that uh on today's show and um i'll share that interview with you now on our wednesday june 23rd show we dealt with the story coming out of florida and how a federal judge in florida um blocked the uh put a halt on the uh, $4 billion in debt relief for African-American farmers, okay? And this was because of a lawsuit in Florida. Now we've talked about the lawsuits in Wisconsin and Texas, but this was, uh, this took place on Wednesday, uh, June 23rd uh, in Florida. So we talked about that on a Wednesday show. There was an article from the Washington Post. It was the first article I saw about this. Federal judge halts black farmers debt relief program in new legal blow. Federal judge halts black farmers debt relief program in a new legal blow. So that was Wednesday, June 23rd. There was a piece from CBS News that I saw Thursday, June 24th that dealt with this story also. And they had an interview with uh john boyd jr okay john boyd jr uh is the president of the black farmers uh union okay so uh, we're going to share that uh segment of cbs this morning with you to get some background information uh on this fight of african-american farmers and it had the interview with uh a couple who are two white farmers husband and wife they're two white farmers uh, as well. So it, we're, we're going to deal with this and keep in mind that the one point th that that 
this debt relief for African-American farmers. This was in the one point nine trillion dollar American Rescue Plan that no Republicans in the House of Representatives or the U.S. Senate voted for. OK, I just want everybody to understand this. All right. This was in the one point nine trillion dollar American Rescue Plan that no Republicans in the House of Representatives or the U.S. Senate voted for, even though it will benefit, even though the one point nine trillion dollar American Rescue Plan will greatly benefit white people who voted to put these Republicans in office in the first place. OK, no Republicans voted for this bill. So we'll, we'll discuss that. All this ties into history. And there was a piece from the Guardian dot com as well that that I saw. Uh, and I, I saw this when I did the story Wednesday. But there's a piece from the Guardian dot com. Black U.S. farmers dismayed as white farmers lawsuit halts relief payments. And this piece from the Guardian dot com gives some background historical information uh, on the on the plight of African-American farmers also. So we'll talk some about that on today's show. And then um, I had to pace myself because I had, you know, I had like <laughs> 10 hours of content that I want to talk about, but only had two hours on Sunday. So we're going to spread this out throughout the week because I'm here six days a week. So I had to pace myself. I mean, you you, you should see all the stuff I wanted to talk about, but we only have two hours. Right. <laughs> and I don't want to go an additional two hours on social media after our two hours up here on the a.m. Superstation WFDF. I, I don't want to do that. OK. Uh, cause I have to teach a class. I have to teach an online class at 7 PM on Monday. I was going to teach my class su Saturday, but I, I went to the, um, I went to the, uh, celebration of life for queen mother ocean dar, uh, uh, Nefertiti L who passed away May 26, 2021 queen mother ocean dar. So the celebration of life was yesterday. So shout out to her family, brother, uh, Shiki and, uh, her son, Ashiki and, and her nephew, Michael and, Sister Sabrina Samaya, who helped organize this, and Chief, uh, Chief uh, Greyhawk, I think it is, helped organize the Celebration of Life. We broadcasted it. I broadcasted it on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network. It's, it's in two videos. So I broadcasted, I think it was like three and a half, four hours, the whole Celebration of Life, performances, speeches, everything. So you can go watch that at our Facebook fan page, The African History Network. But uh, I, I was there on Saturday, and when I left out, my internet was down because there was an outage in my area of Comcast. And um, I, I pushed my Saturday online course to Sunday. And I was going to do it Sunday at 12 noon. And then I got up this morning and the internet and Comcast was back out. So uh, we're going to do that. Uh, our Saturday course, we're going to meet Monday, uh, June 28th, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But I, I was um, looking at uh, Equal Justice Initiative. EJI.org, Equal Justice Initiative. And June 26, 1844. June 26, 1844. Did you know that the, the, the state of Oregon, with well, the territory of Oregon at the time, did you know Oregon banned free African Americans from living in the state of Oregon? We're going to talk about that. Because people ask the question, why is Oregon so white? Oregon was brought into the Union as a white state. This goes into history. This ties into the Oregon um, uh, state constitution, also of 1857. All this history is connected. So uh, we're going to talk about Oregon banned free black people on June 26, 1844. The effects of this are still being felt today. You want to know why Oregon is so white? <laughs> that was the plan from the beginning. <laughs> and then we talk about Oregon State Constitution. We talk about the Mississippi State Constitution, Louisiana State Constitution, 1898, Texas State Constitution, 1876. And then you wonder why Republicans are passing laws in their state legislatures and their state board of education is trying to suppress the teaching of history and systemic racism and the history of slavery, things like that. Because if you understand how this thing is constructed, you could dismantle it and rebuild it, build it back stronger, better, like the six million dollar man. You can you can build it back better, <laughs> build back better. Right. <laughs> so we'll deal with all that on today's show. Now, on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. 
because right now it's correct wrong behavior what you do for yourself what you do to yourself and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself what you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself what you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read heard and seen about yourself so when you control the radius of a man or a woman's thoughts you can control the circumference of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know now we deal with a number of different topics here on the african history network show we deal with current events and history and politics education economic empowerment entrepreneurship relationships love sex health, health issues love sex health issues and much much more sign up for our email newsletter text the word kemet k-e-m-e-t the 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter text the word kemet k-e-m-e-t the 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter also visit our website africanhistorynetwork.com africanhistorynetwork.com uh, we have a new uh, class starting up of the online course that I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We have a new class starting up on um, starting up on Sunday, uh, Sunday, July 4th, Sunday, July 4th, 2021, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. OK, this is a 10 week online course that I teach. We deal with thousands of years of history and we do what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. This is um, we do. We're going to do this 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time starts up on the 4th of July uh, or some people call it the 4th of July, Sunday, July 4th, 2021. Uh, so if you go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, uh, scroll down the home page. Uh, you see the information for a radio show. Scroll down. We have the information there for the online course. Click right here to register here. Uh, class is regularly $130. It's on sale $80. Click here to enroll. As soon as you enroll, you can start watching content. As soon as you enroll, you can start watching content. Uh, in addition to this Sunday class, we'll also enroll you in the current Saturday class that's going on right now. We have three more sessions of the Saturday class. So as soon as you enroll, you can watch classes one through seven of the Saturday class. And you can join us live in class for the Saturday class as well. And then also you'll be registered for the Sunday, July 4th class uh, starts up Sunday, July 4th, 2021, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time of ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa. Understand the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. Now we do the classes live. All the sessions are recorded. All the sessions are recorded so you can go back and watch it over and over again. So if you miss any of it, that's fine. Not a problem. You can go back and watch it over and over again. Um, and you can use this with your children. Also, I would say it's PG 13. It's not overly graphic. I don't do a lot of cursing, things like that. Uh, so it's a powerful, powerful class. We also have guest speakers. So when you register for the course, you can watch the class we did uh, on uh, Saturday, June 12th. When our guest speaker was Dr. David M. Hotep, author of the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. And we dealt with the African presence in this country going back at least 51,700 years ago. And he talked about a new discovery in uh, Central America that shows an African presence going back at least uh, 250,000 years ago. OK, you'll be able to watch that class and you can watch the uh, class where uh, uh, archaeologist Nubia Wartford spoke to our class as well. She's African-American female archaeologist from Detroit. She goes to the Sudan and does archaeological digs. So you'll be able to watch that also. So you can register for that. We just posted a link here. It's also at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All right, we're coming up on a break. You listen to the African History Network show right here on the Anton AM Superstation, the future radio. Uh, when we come back, we'll talk about black farmers' debt forgiveness stopped by Florida federal judge after white farmers sues the Biden administration claiming discrimination. But y'all got white farmers got almost twenty six billion dollars in twenty twenty from the Trump administration, the COVID-19 payments and African-American farmers got one tenth of one percent. So where's the discrimination? We'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by, everybody. Stand by. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on you know, social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in also. OK, register for the online course that I teach. You still needs to register for that class. We posted the link here. As soon as you register, you can start watching content. 
How's everybody doing? Back from break in four minutes. You can also support the African History Network, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, or through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. We're going to post this link here. Uh, SB asks, how am I doing? I'm tired. I'm going to bed after the show. I ain't, uh, I'm, this ain't, I'm going to bed. We know I'm not going over. I ain't going past 11 o'clock tonight. I'm tired. Stand by. All right. Also, we have the uh, my June two, my Juneteenth uh, lecture. We have that on DVD and digital download as well. Uh, it's a two two hour presentation. Let me see. Pull that up. Stand by. Back from breaking. Two minutes. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, June 27th, 2021, and we're live. I'm back from Atlanta. It was raining in Atlanta. It was raining here in Detroit. Uh, it's crazy, crazy. It was crazy time in Atlanta because um, we got rained out on Saturday. Uh, it basically rained all three days, pretty much, but Saturday was the worst. We call some of the tropical storm from the hurricane coming from the uh, coming from the south. So uh, it's a crazy time. All right. Calling numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the calling number if you have a quick question or comment. Right, so on our Wednesday, June 23rd show, and all these shows are archived uh, at our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, uh, and my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. And they're also on audio podcast format on iHeartRadio, CastBox, Stitcher, iTunes. Just search for the African History Network show. But I, I talked about a, a new story. Uh, uh, well, we continued the discussion dealing with African-American farmers. And there was a new development um, dealing with out of Florida. OK, new development out of Florida. And I, I talked about this article here. We're going to go to clip one in just a second, Jalen, uh, from CBS, uh, CBS this morning. I, I talked about this story here. A uh, federal judge halts black farmers debt relief program and new legal blow. An estimated four billion dollars of the American Rescue Plan hangs in the balance slated to restore land and economic stability to African-American farmers who were victims of discrimination, who were victims of discrimination. So uh, now this one came out uh, the day that the verdict came out from the federal judge. Uh, this was Wednesday, June 23rd. Uh, black and minority farmers were dealt a new legal blow on Wednesday when a Florida federal court issued a preliminary injunction halting a key part of the Biden administration's federal stimulus stimulus relief package that forgave agricultural debts that forgave agricultural debts. Uh, to farmers of color, okay, including African American farmers. Now, Af this is something that African American farmers have been fighting for for years. Now, U.S. District Judge uh, Marcia Morales Howard halted loan forgiveness payments and debt relief for disadvantaged farmers anywhere in the United States, according to the Middle District Court of Florida ruling. The lawsuit was filed by white farmer. Scott Wynn, W-Y-N-N, of Jennings, Florida, who also, farm, who, who also has farm loans and, ha and has faced financial hardship during the pandemic. 
He said the debt relief program discriminates against him by race. Now, he includes the 100 years of preferential treatment that white farmers got from the federal government in the U.S. Department of Agriculture and how African-American farmers were discriminated against this from getting loans from the federal government. He skips over all that. This is I, I find it interesting that it seems like I could be wrong. I could be wrong on this, but it seems like white people have amnesia when it comes to history, unless you're talking about Confederate monuments, unless you're talking about Columbus Day, President's Day, Civil War enactment. See, all this other stuff, it seems like some white people just have amnesia. They just don't remember. This is just escapes their mind. I, I'm, I'm trying to figure this out. I, 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 I can't figure it out how you have amnesia like this. But luckily for you, Obamacare covers pre-existing conditions. So <laughs> we can fix you up. So uh, Howard wrote that uh, Judge Howard wrote that in crafting this debt program, benefiting farmers based on race, that, quote, Congress also must heed its obligation to do away with governmentally imposed discrimination based on race. Yeah, but what about the previous hundred years? African-American farmers have lost 92 percent of their land, almost 12 million acres of land over the past 100 years, largely due to discrimination from the federal government. So so the judge ruled Congress must also heed its obligation to do away with gov governmentally imposed discrimination based on race. But this isn't discriminating based upon race. This is trying to this is trying to remedy the 100 past years of discrimination. After white farmers just got almost 26 billion dollars in COVID-19 payments in 2020 from the Trump administration. And African-American farmers only got one tenth of one percent of that payment, 20.8 million. Now, she went on to say it appears that in adopting Section 1005's strict race-based debt relief remedy, Congress moved with great speed to address the history of discrimination, but did not move with great care. Yet Judge Howard also made clear that the Agriculture Department could continue to prepare to deliver the debt relief until the program is found to be, quote, constitutionally permissible, end quote. She, she, she also ruled that the Agriculture Department, U.S. Department of Agriculture, could continue to prepare to deliver the debt relief until the program is found to be, quote unquote, constitutionally permissible. Now, the debt forgiveness program is part of President Biden's American Rescue Plan and that no Republicans in the House of Representatives of the U.S. Senate voted for, even though they're in their districts talking about how great the American Rescue Plan is and the money going to help businesses and bars recover from the pandemic and the $300 in, in uh, uh, unemployment uh, insurance, federal unemployment insurance each week and the money for schools to open up. And they're talking about all this, but not a sing now, not one of you traders voted for the bill. The debt forgiveness program is part of President Biden's American Rescue Plan. And from the and from the move and from the moment the USDA launched the program, it faced assault in courts. Approximately four billion dollars was slated to go to disadvantaged farmers, primarily for debt relief, but also for grants, training and education. But also for grant because there's a total of five billion. It's four billion in debt relief is about another billion in grants and training and education. It's a total of five billion dollars. The program was temporarily put on hold due to a separate restraining order in a case by a white farmer in Wisconsin. However, even with that Wisconsin order is re it, however, even if that Wisconsin order is reconsidered or even reversed in July when a ruling is expected, this new nationwide injunction would still keep the program on hold for some time. Now, the Florida case is considered the first nationwide preliminary injunction, said lawyers for the group Pacific Legal Foundation, which filed the lawsuit in May 2021. Um, they said, quote, this program is discriminatory because it bases eligibility on loan forgiveness solely on the basis of being a member of a minority group, regardless of your circumstances. If you're if you're a white farmer, regardless of your circumstances, you are categorically ineligible. 
Well, white farmers weren't discriminated against based upon race for the past hundred years. That once again, I, I'm amazed at how um, people just have all this uh, selective amnesia. It must be something in the water that you're drinking. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I'm trying to figure this out. How is it just all of a sudden you ignorant? How is it you, you just have selective amnesia? You it, all this stuff just is non-existent. The past hundred years, poof, it just goes away. It, it's just non-existent. So, um, I was online doing research and came across this article here for. Uh, actually, I was doing the research on just updates to this lawsuit. So I was online, came across this article here from um, uh, CBS, CBS News. Now, this is from the next day after the, the verdict from Judge uh, Howard. OK, this is from June 24th, 2021. Black farmers might not receive their own debt relief funding. OK, now I, I want I want people to understand. And I talked about this uh, when I was in uh, Atlanta during my presentations in Atlanta at the Juneteenth Festival at Centennial Olympic Park. The reason why this funding is in the $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan is because a Senator Raphael Warnock of Georgia, African-American Senator, and Senator Cory Booker of New, of New Jersey. This is the main reason why it's in there because they, they were fighting to get this in there. And um, when the first lawsuit was filed, uh, Roland Martin interviewed John Boyd Jr. of the Black Farmers Union when the first lawsuit was filed. And, and John Boyd said that what was actually in the American Rescue Plan dealing with debt forgiveness and training and education, he said that's just a fraction of what they actually wanted. To, uh, there's a um, Justice for Black Farmers bill. OK, there's a justice for black farmers bill that Cory Booker and Reverend Raphael Warnock have been pushing. What is in the American Rescue Plan is just is just a portion of the justice for black farmers bill. John Boyd said what they did was they put into the American Rescue Plan what they thought they could actually get passed and not have a whole lot of opposition against because they knew they knew it was going to be some opposition. But, but they, they put in there what they thought they could get past and really not have a huge amount of opposition because there's more that they're pushing for. But it's not but it's going to come later. So, you know. You have some people say, oh, well, they need more, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, they, they know this. But also you have to balance that with what you can actually get past and sign in the law and then what you can keep. Because there's going to be people suing to keep you from getting it. This is why you have to understand the long game. You got to understand into the end game all the way to checkmate. Okay, unfortunately, people, a lot of our people don't know how to play chess. Black farmers might not receive their own debt relief funding. June 24th, 2021 from CBS this morning, CBS News. So it talks about how earlier this year, black farmers were slated to receive billions of dollars in federal aid to wipe away their uh, their U.S. Department of Agriculture loans. The chance of actually getting that money, however, is starting to wither. That's because two federal judges have have blocked uh, two federal judges have blocked African-American and Hispanic, Latino and other farmers of color from getting the debt relief payments. So they talk about judges in recent weeks have granted temporary injunctions on the debt subsidies. OK, then they talk about uh, a district uh, judge, federal district judge uh, Marcia Morales Howard in Jacksonville, Florida, set an injunction Wednesday, June 23rd, one month, one month after white farmer Scott Wynn Jennings in Florida filed a lawsuit arguing that he couldn't apply for the debt relief program. Um, U.S. District Judge William uh, Greisbach in Milwaukee. This was another lawsuit, the one, the one in Wisconsin. Yeah, Wisconsin, Texas, and Florida, okay, that I know of. U.S. District Judge William Greisbach in Milwaukee also issued a temporary restraining order after the conservative Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty filed suit in April of 2021, arguing that white farmers are not eligible for the program amounted to a violation of their constitutional rights. There are similar legal challenges in Texas in Tennessee and Wyoming, S similar legal charges in Texas, Tennessee and Wyoming. Now, 
what I find interesting is what were all these white farmers when African-American farmers were being shut out of the money uh, for the past 100 years, number one. But since y'all have amnesia, let's just go back to 2020. Because March 25th, 2021, uh, the new U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, was interviewed by the Washington Post, okay? And he talked about, now he was the Secretary of Agriculture under the Obama administration. Black farmers didn't like him then. Okay, he said he realizes what he did wrong. He's going to make up for it this time around. Biden said he chose they wanted somebody else as secretary of agriculture. Many of them want to marshal fudge, a uh, member of the Congressional Black Caucus. Many of them want to marshal fudge as agriculture secretary. Marshall fudge uh, became a uh, uh, secretary of HUD. Biden said he needs somebody who understands the Department of Agriculture and has already worked there to hit the ground running. So he chose Tom Vilsack. If we go look at the uh, interview that Tom Vilsack did, uh, Secretary of Agriculture under, under the Biden administration, who was Secretary of Agriculture under the Obama administration, he did an interview March 25th, 2021 with Washington Post. Name of that interview, name of the article, go read this. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack says only 0.1% of Trump administration's COVID farm relief went to black farmers. Only 0.1% of Trump administration's COVID farm relief went to black farmers. Okay. This is a big, big, uh, interview that he did in, in the article. He says of those who identify their race or ethnicity, black farmers received only $20.8 million, $20.8 million. That's less than 21 million, only $20.8 million or nearly 26 billion in two rounds of payments under the coronavirus food assistance program announced by the, by the Trump administration in April 2021. What were all these white farmers then? Why weren't they filing discrimination lawsuits? Why weren't they crying discrimination against black farmers? This is what I want to know. They don't think black farmers' lives matter? This is all these white farmers crying crocodile tears now. Where were you when African-American farmers just last day? I ain't talking about 100 years ago. I ain't talking about 1965. We're going to talk about 1965 in just a minute because we're going to deal with some background history on this. Let's just go back to last. Since y'all have amnesia, let's just go back to last year. You remember 2020 when Trump was in office? The, the, the trade in chief, Benedict Donald? I'm sure you have fond memories of that. Where were y'all when black farmers were being discriminated? What were the lawsuits on behalf of them? What were the interviews? That's what I want to know. Quote, uh, Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack said, quote, we saw 99 percent of the money going to white farmers and one percent going to socially disadvantaged farmers. And if you break that down to how much went to black farmers, it's 0.1 percent. He said, let's look at it another way. The top 10 percent of farmers in the country receive 60 percent of the value of the covid payments. And the bottom 10 percent got 0.26 percent, got one a little more than one quarter of one percent. Of the three point four million farmers in the United States, only forty five thousand or one point three percent of African-American farmers. It was a million to, in 1920. It was a million African-American farmers in 1920 is about forty five thousand today according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. They would know. So read this full article here. I don't have time to get through all of it. We got a lot of information here. We only had two hours. I'm trying to stay within two hours. But read this here from the Washington Post. Now, I want to go to, we're going to go to clip one, Jalen. I want to go to this clip here from CBS this morning. They did this story uh, this clip here is from January 19th, 2021. It's on their YouTube channel also. This deals with black farmers call for a uh, call for justice. OK, uh, let's go to this clip. 
CBS This Morning Saturday. The American Rescue Plan, which became law in March, was supposed to deliver billions of dollars in aid and loan forgiveness to the nation's underprivileged farmers. Instead, those funds are being held up by a federal lawsuit. The promise of aid that fails to materialize is all too familiar to many farmers of color, long subjected to discrimination in government programs. We went to Virginia to talk with a fourth-generation black farmer leading the call for change. John Boyd has been tilling this soil for the last three decades, land that's been in his family for 100 years. My grandfather was able to raise 15 children on his farm. You say you're the classic case yes. of the black farmer. The classic case. Why? Many black farmers uh, were tied historically to the land, uh, either through uh, sharecropping or generational land. That's the way the blacks uh, did it, and, and we were old school farmers. These are our uh, tobacco curing bonds. Boyd is president of the National Black Farmers Association, representing thousands of black farmers across the U.S. We farm with limited resources. Banks weren't lending us any money. USDA really dogged black farmers and poor processing time. We took 387 days to process a black farm loan request in, in less than 30 days to process a white farm loan request. In March, President Biden announced his plan to right that wrong, providing $4 billion in loan relief to socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers in his $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan. Uh, this debt relief is designed to catch them up. We spoke to Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack in April about disparities in the last year alone. In the COVID relief packages that were announced prior to the rescue plan, uh, of those self-identified farmers who identified as white or black or, or Hispanic, black farmers received roughly $20 million in help through those COVID packages. White farmers received over $5.5 billion. And the reason for it is because they were able to grow over a period of time, over, over the decades, able to fully utilize uh, the uh, full extent of USDA programs. Black farmers were not able to do that because of discrimination. But last week, a federal judge in Wisconsin halted those payments, saying the U.S. Department of Agriculture's use of race-based criteria in the administration of the program violates their right to equal protection under the law. It's one thing to help people because they themselves have been the victim of identifiable past discrimination. But it's a wholly other thing to hand out benefits or to grant the preference based solely on the color of one's skin. Rick Eisenberg is the president of the Wisconsin Institute of Law and Liberty, the firm representing 12 white farmers across nine states that challenge the policy. So you don't argue that systemic racism has perhaps disadvantaged black farmers in the past. Certainly there have been some farmers who have been, black farmers who have been discriminated against in the past. There was a lawsuit. The way to stop discriminating on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race and not to think that there is some way that we can balance the scales um, by discriminating just a little bit. The USDA isn't backing down, telling CBS News, we respectfully disagree with this temporary order and will continue to forcefully defend our ability to carry out this act of Congress and deliver debt relief to socially disadvantaged borrowers. I wasn't aware that um, some farmers weren't receiving the same as other farmers. Cheryl Ash and her husband James are plaintiffs in the suit. They breed hogs in Jasper, Missouri. They're only about four days old. I didn't know that existed, but I think it doesn't matter what color of skin you have. If you're a farmer, you should be able to qualify. And, and hey, hey Jayla, pause it right there for a minute. Pause it right, right there, Jayla. Equality. Pause it right there for a minute. Just back it up about 20, 30 seconds. Okay, so she, she, here you have this white couple. And the lady said she's, part, she's one of the plaintiffs in the lawsuit. OK, claiming that they're being discriminated against because they're white. She said she did not know that non-white farmers were treated differently, discriminated against by the government, the, the Department of Agriculture. This is basically what she's saying. Uh, I don't know where she's been, but at the same time, I keep telling you, America has to have a massive history lesson. This ties into Juneteenth. We're going to talk about Juneteenth becoming a federal holiday. 
And it's a powerful weapon if we know how to use it properly, just like any weapon. You have to be trained on how to use it. Otherwise, you can blow your brains out. But America has to have a massive history lesson because Americans are very ignorant of history. Americans are ignorant of history. Americans are ignorant of the U.S. Constitution. Almost two thirds of Americans couldn't name the three branches of government. One of five Americans couldn't name one branch of government. So when you try to get remedy for a his, so something that was historical that existed 246 years, then decades of Jim Crow segregation, redlining, housing segregation, discrimination when it comes to the New Deal, the GI Bill, all different types of things like this. When we talk about repairing the damage, it's not just slavery. It's not because we didn't get paid this during slavery. That means you don't really understand the damage that was done during slavery. America must have a massive history lesson. And what the Juneteenth federal holiday does is forces a conversation about a history that Republicans are passing laws in their state legislatures to suppress the teaching of that history, to suppress the teaching of systemic racism, to attack the 1619 project. OK, if, if we look at this very quickly, then we'll go back to the clip. U.S. farmers, U.S. African-American farmers make up about 45,000 farmers out of 3.4 million farmers today. They're 1.3 percent of U.S. farmers. In 1920, it was about a million African-American farmers. Actually, from the count from, uh, that one would be from theguardian.com, which is the next article we're going to, they break this down. Uh, in 1920, there were 949,889 black farmers. Today, they say they're 48,697. OK, a little more than forty five thousand. Some some numbers I've seen are about forty five thousand. This one puts it at forty eight thousand six hundred and ninety seven. So then you, you so you have this and then you also have. Uh, let's bring up this one here now. Approximately seventeen thousand. Let me see here. Approximately 17,000 farmers qualify for assistance. Approximately 17,000 farmers in general, not African American farmers, approximately 17,000 uh, farmers in general apply for this assistance. Okay. Now, from the from the Guardian, uh, according to Tracy Lloyd McCurty, According to Tracy Lord M Lloyd McCurty, who is the executive director of the Black Belt Justice Center, she said, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture's data, only 2,000 of the 17,000 farmers of color with direct loans with U.S. with the USDA or African Americans, and less than five percent of all Black farmers will receive debt cancellation. Okay, so I want to get more information on those numbers, but. For the 2,000 farmers, black farmers that qualify, they're waiting on the money because I've read articles about it. They're waiting on the money. OK, this this is huge for them. And we have to keep in mind, as, as John Boyd said when he was interviewed by Roland Martin, he said this is only of what they really wanted and what's in the justice for black farmers bill. This is only a fraction of that that's in the one point nine trillion dollar American rescue plan. OK, let's go back to this clip, Jalen weren't receiving the same as other farmers. Cheryl Ash and her husband, James, are plaintiffs in the suit. They breed hogs in Jasper, Missouri. They're only about four days old. I didn't know that existed, but I think it doesn't matter what color of skin you have. If you're a farmer, you should be able to qualify and, and get those programs and those grants. Equality is best, especially from our government. At the turn of the last century, there were nearly one million black farmers in America. The USDA now says there are only 45,000 in a country of three million farmers. And less than 40 percent of them, 17,000, qualify for assistance. At the bottom, they would use old rocks from the farm. For boys, those numbers showcase decades of discrimination and disparity. If he pledges he will fight, to remedy. Well, let me say this. Uh, I'm going to die a farmer. I'm very optimistic about the future, but I want people to know that uh, it's not going to happen by itself. Well, the Department of Agriculture is going to answer the suit. They are uh, essentially advising borrowers to, to just move forward with their claims. 
But as we speak, there are some five other lawsuits that are already coming down the pike. But the big question here is whether or not these black farmers, farmers of color, should have a remedy for those years, decades of discrimination that the USDA acknowledges. There have been lawsuits, uh, but oftentimes they aren't fully paid out. And I think everybody agrees equality is best, as she said. There's exactly. just a question of how you actually get there. Right. And and what was the inequality earlier, and how do you, can you make up for that? Look, it's tough. It's tough. It, it's not just when, this industry. When, it's, here, when it's unfair, when, when you see unfairness out there, it, it's not pretty, right? And so now I think everyone sees a taste of it. The question is, you know, like years and years, how you remedy it. Okay. All right. So that is from um, CBS this morning, June 19th, 2021. That's on YouTube, uh, their YouTube channel. The That clip is called The History of Discrimination Against Black Farmers in the U.S. The History of Discrimination Against Black Farmers in the U.S. And that is um, part of this article from June 24th, 2021 from CBS.com. So this article uh, came out the day after the ruling uh, from uh, Judge Marcia Morales Howard uh, in Jacksonville, Florida, the federal judge. Okay, so very quickly here, because we're coming up here, uh, here on the break, calling numbers 313-778-7600, 313-778-7600 is the calling number if you have a quick question or comment. Uh, if we go down, okay, John Boyd, president of the Black Farmers Association. Now, he told, uh, now John Boyd said he's going to fight this all the way to the U U.S. Supreme Court. He said he expects this fight could take two years. But at, at, in the article here from CBS, it says, at issue is the Emergency Relief for Farmers of Color Act. The Emergency Relief for Farmers of Color Act, which passed Congress in uh, the spring uh, 2021. Uh, the legislation funnels $4 billion to the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture to forgive direct or guaranteed loans given to farmers and ranchers of color. Another $1 billion was slated for farmer grants, college scholarships, and other efforts for minority growers. Okay. So um, read the rest of this article here. I, I, I'm just amazed at um, how people just have, you know, selective amnesia. All right. But I, I want to go to this article here from um, I want to flip over to the one from the from uh, the Guardian. So this one here from uh, the Guardian gives some background historical uh, information dealing with African-American farmers. And, you know, we've been talking about this here uh, on the show for some time because this also ties into politics. Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, the adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. The U.S. Department of Agriculture directly impacts farmers, regardless of any color. It directly impacts uh, farmers, and there's a federal government paid for by taxpayer dollars. So if we look at this uh, piece here from The Guardian, uh, I was looking at this when the, when the news came out on the 23rd, uh, June 23rd, uh, black U.S. farmers dismayed as white farmers loss lawsuit halts relief payments. Black U.S. farmers dismayed as white farmers lawsuit halts relief payments. They're trying to figure out what the, what's wrong with you people. Why, why y'all? Why are you upset? OK. Uh, and then there was one from The New York Times. Um. There was, there was one from the New York Times that we talked about here, and it, the, 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 the title of it was a little insulting. Um, you, the title of it was a little insulting where they talked about a windfall for, uh, quote unquote, minority farmers. This ain't a windfall. They ain't hit the lottery. This is because they were being discriminated against for the past 100 years. But 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 look at this article. Go read. We're not gonna have time to talk about this. We talked about this before. You can feel the tension. This is a direct quote. Quote, you can feel the tension, end quote. A windfall for minority farmers divides rural America. This is from the New York Times, May 22nd, 2021, updated June 24, 2021. 
a four billion dollar federal fund meant to confront how racial injustice has shaped American farming has angered white farmers who say they are being unfairly excluded. Now, what just think how some people act if we got reparations or we were about to get reparations? How many lawsuits you think be filed? I'm just, I'm just, I'm just asking. Uh, they they talked to, to, to this one farmer. His name is Lewis Shade Lewis, and Shade Lewis is in the picture right here. Okay, he's an African American farmer. Uh, and Shade Lewis, uh, he's 29 years old. He spent the past decade scratching out a living. Okay. And he said, you can feel the tension. We've caught a lot of heat from the conservative Caucasian farmers. Okay. We've caught a lot of heat from the conservative Caucasian farmers. Uh, so re re read this article here. We'll deal with this on the other side of the break. We're going to deal with some background history on discrimination against African-American farmers. Then we'll talk about uh, uh, Juneteenth. And I'll share with you the interview that Angela Matthews did with me of Urban Interest dealing with uh, the history of the Juneteenth holiday and how it can be how we can use this uh, to push our issues and agendas. And we'll talk about in 1844 when Oregon banned free black people in the state of Oregon. You wonder why Oregon Oregon was brought into the union as a white state. We'll deal with this on the other side of the break. The African History Network show on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by. Stand by, everybody. Share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in also. How's everybody doing? Who still needs to register for my online course on Sunday? Uh, starts up Sunday, July 4th. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. How's everybody doing today? All right, share this broadcast on social media platforms. Back from break in two minutes. Stand by. All right, let's see who we have here. Have SB, Tony, Kim. Stand by. We'll post a link here for my new online course.
Hills, Detroit, 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, a division of Adele Media. The views and opinions expressed on any program are those of the producers and or the persons appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of 9, 10 a.m. Superstation or Adele Media. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the future radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Sunday, June 27th, 2021. And we are live calling numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the calling number if you have a quick question or comment. In the uh, first hour, we were talking about the uh, ruling uh, that came down Wednesday, June 23rd uh, from a uh, federal judge in Jacksonville, Florida a uh, pause on the uh, debt relief program for African-American farmers and farmers of color. Uh, $4 billion debt relief program that's in the uh, $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan. And so we'll go back to that in just a minute. I want to um, remind you that we have a new online course starting up that I teach starting up Sunday july 4th the 4th of july or the 4th of july for some people sunday july 4th 2021 12 noon to 2 p.m eastern standard time it's a 10-week online course ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade what they didn't teach you in school now we deal with thousands of years of history and we deal with what led up to uh the transatlantic slave trade uh taking place i do a powerpoint presentation we have uh book references articles video clips guest speakers and when we deal with the transatlantic slave trade we can't start in 1441 with the portuguese going into mauritania we can't uh start in uh, 1619 in uh virginia in 1619 with those 20 and odd africans on the the white lion pirate ship we have to deal with thousands of years of history and deal with ancient Africa, deal with the Nile Valley region of Africa, uh, deal with ancient Kemet, uh, Ta-Nehisi, Nubia, and deal with what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place, okay? So we do this uh, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., 10 consecutive Sundays. I do the class live. All the sessions are recorded, so you can go back and watch them over and over again, and you can watch from around the world. When you uh, go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, scroll down the page, you'll see the information for the radio show. Um, and then you'll see the information for the online course. And we have the flyer here as well. Click right here on register here. It takes you to the next page and click on enroll. As soon as you enroll, you can start watching bonus content. In addition to the Sunday course that starts up July 4th, uh, we'll also register you into the current Saturday course that I have. Uh, of the same class current Saturday uh, section we have three more sessions of the Saturday section you'll be enrolled in that one you can go back and watch classes one through seven you can watch that bonus archive content and you can watch the uh, join us for the class live on Saturdays 12 noon Eastern Standard Time we have three more sessions of the Saturday class and you'll be enrolled for the uh, Sunday course that starts up Sunday July 4th 2 uh, 2021, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So we're going to post a link here on the thread of the broadcast. Uh, class is regularly $130 on sale, $80. You can watch from around the world. You can use this with your children also. I would say it's PG-13, uh, the subject matter. But you're going to learn a ton of information in the class. And as soon as you register, you can watch the uh, June 12th class where Dr. David M. Hotep author of the book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence, uh, spoke to our class. And he talked about his new book that should be out in the next week or so, The First Americans Were Africans uh, Revised and Revisited. He talked about the African presence in the um, uh, Americas, uh, in, in this land we call the United States of America, dating back at least 51,700 years ago, and in the uh central america dating back at least two hundred fifty thousand years ago based upon new research you'll also be able to watch the class we did um a few weeks ago with uh sister nubia wartford 
who's an African-American female archaeologist. OK, so and we talked about the origins of ancient Kush and the African queens of antiquity. So we posted the link here uh, and you can register at our website, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. All right. Um, I'm going to go back to this quickly, and then we'll go to the phone lines here. Uh, the the piece from the Guardian. I mentioned that right before the break. The piece from the Guardian. Dot uh, com. Black U.S. farmers dismayed as white farmers lawsuits halt relief payments. And in the um, in the article, there's a, there's a part of it here that deals with history that I want to tie into. Um, they cite, uh, they, they quote one African-American farmer who said, we're not going to be defeated. His name is Rodney Bradshaw. We're not going to be defeated. We're going to see this thing through. Now, black farmers peaked uh, in 1920 when there were 949,889 uh, African-American farmers. Today, there are only about 48,697 or roughly around 45,000. They account for only 1.4% or 1.3% of the country's 3.4 million farmers. 95% of the farmers in the, uh, in the U.S. are white. 95% of the farmers in the U.S. are white farmers. And uh, African-American farmers own 0.52% of America's land. OK, about one half of one percent of America's land. Now, part of the reason. Uh, part of the reason was displacement of black farmers due to the New Deal. OK, part of the reason was displacement of black farmers due to the New Deal. Whose purpose. Uh, was to help farmers by paying them to reduce crop production thereby forcing food prices to rise okay this goes back to the new deal president franklin roosevelt if you read the book how white folks got so rich the untold story of american white supremacy and this is the second edition of the book it has uh, uh sterling on the cover uh former owner of the la clippers um but but if you read how white folks uh uh donald sterling if you read how white folks got so rich the untold story of american white supremacy they deal with the new deal and even though there were some benefits in the new deal for african americans I mean, even though we were able to take advantage of some of it i mean it was better than nothing it did also discriminate against us in many ways because a lot of resources were put at the state level as opposed to coming directly from the federal government so in a lot of southern states, we were discriminated against in a lot of southern states and getting benefits, especially coming from, especially for African-American farmers. But part of the reason was displacement of black farmers due to New Deal legislation, whose purpose was to help farmers by paying them to reduce crop production, thereby forcing food prices to rise. But white farmers used the money to purchase mechanical farming e equipment and pushed out black sharecroppers whose work was no longer needed due to the decreased production. They pushed out, they, they took this money from the government and, and they were able to mechanize their farms. As Dr. King talks about in his speech in Mississippi in 1966, they were able to mechanize their farms and then they're gonna, they're gonna fire a lot of black sharecroppers and push them out and then they're homeless in the great, during the Great Depression. Now, disenfran disenfranchisement did not stop there. In 1965, the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights found that the U.S. Department of Agriculture discriminated against black farmers when providing financial assistance, assistance payments and loans. In 1965, the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights found that the U.S. Department of Agriculture discriminated against African-American farmers uh, when providing financial assistance payments and loans. In 1999, the Clinton administration admitted that the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the U.S. Department of Agriculture's loan practices were discriminatory in what is now known as the Pickford Settlement, P-I-G-F-O-R-D, the Pickford Settlement. The Pickford Settlement was named for uh, the black farmer Timothy Pickford of North Carolina, who was the lead plaintiff in a victorious 1997 class action lawsuit. 
still the largest civil rights settlement ever won against the federal government. It was supposed to pay out over one billion dollars to black farmers, but less than 16,000 payments were received, even though more than 22,000 claims were filed. There were also tens of thousands of denied claims due to late filings, which black farmers and their legal representatives blame on mismanagement of the U.S. Department of Agriculture communication of deadlines. OK, so read the rest of this. Then they talk about black farmers need capital, et cetera. Read the rest of this. I don't have time to get through all of it. I don't have time to get through all this article, but this gives some background information. Black U.S. farmers dismayed as white farmers who have amnesia file lawsuits. They, they didn't say they have amnesia. I'm saying it. OK, <laughs> black U.S. farmers dismayed as white farmers lawsuit halts relief payments. Funds intended to address discriminatory policies, but promises to black farmers are always put on hold, said, said, said one farmer. OK. All right, let's go quickly to the phone lines. Let's go to Marathon Line One. Uh, welcome to the African History Network show. Tell us where you're calling from, and you have a quick question or comment. Hey, this is Marathon. I'm calling from Toon Productions LLC in Detroit, and I'm really enjoying the show. Keep up the good work. You're right on point. And uh, this is my first time listening. It won't be my last. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks. You have a quick question or comment, or was that it? No, that was it. I, okay. I just, uh, I'm not usually on the on the radio, listening to the radio at this time. I'm, I'm impressed. Okay, no problem. All right, thanks for calling. Keep listening, Marathon. Thank you. Keep listening. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Okay, 313-778-7600 is uh, the calling number if you have a quick question or comment. Uh, also, we want to remind you that on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF, uh, they will be airing the Rocket Mortgage uh, Classic. OK, the golf classic Ro Rocket Mortgage Classic uh, Thursday, July 1st, uh, 2021 and Friday, July 2nd. It'll be 12 noon to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And on Sunday, July 3rd and uh, sorry, Saturday, July 3rd and Sunday, July 4th, 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can listen on 9, 10 a.m. Uh, the Superstation WFDF uh, in Detroit, but also you can listen on listen on Sirius XM Radio as well. OK, the Rocket Mortgage Classic uh, 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF will be carrying uh, that uh, golf classic. All right. 313-778-7600 is the call in number. If you have a quick question or comment. So read that article from The Guardian. Uh, I want to switch gears here. I want to go to. Uh, the next story. So uh, this deals with Juneteenth. We're going to go to clip two, Jalen. Um, I was in Atlanta for the ninth annual Juneteenth Parade and Music Festival. And um, I got a call from Elena Fruit, well, a text message from Elena Fruit J. She wanted to set up an interview with me for Angela Matthews on the Urban Interest Show on um, Urban News Network. Um, it's a uh, internet TV. It's not radio, internet TV. So we discussed Juneteenth and the Juneteenth federal holiday. I talked about how the Juneteenth federal holiday forces a conversation about history. Republicans are passing laws to suppress. All right. And then um, I'm going to share that interview with you. After that, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the history to make Juneteenth a federal holiday. Now, contrary to popular belief, because I saw all type of ignorant ass memes people are putting out. Now, the first thing you should question, ask yourself is one. See, I'm a researcher and I've been in media for a long time. I understand propaganda. Now, the first question I ask is who created these memes? Because the most of that stuff is historically inaccurate. Most of that stuff is factually and historically inaccurate. So the first question I'm asking, who created all these memes? You got one of a black guy with a bone in his mouth. Talking about this is designed to pacify us. Who the hell in their right mind to think that a federal holiday, all these bills that we're pushing for. Now, let, let me, let me put, just put it like this. If you don't study politics on a daily basis, just say so. Because I've seen some of the most ignorant ass memes come out over this. And I have to ask a question. First question I ask, who created these memes? Secondly, do they actually live in the United States? Third, are they African-American? Fourth. What books have you read about history lately? Have you studied the history of Juneteenth? 
and the fight to make Juneteenth a federal holiday, that ain't starting 2020. That goes back to the late 1960s. So I sent the I sent this interview out through Facebook because we've been rebroadcasting re re the interview like I do all these shows and all this stuff. And I sent it to one of my teachers, Dr. Leonard Jeffries. Dr. Leonard Jeffries, he called me. And we were talking about Juneteenth. He said, this is our time. He said, this is he said, this is something that's very powerful that's, that has happened to make Juneteenth a federal holiday. If you don't know who Dr. Leonard Jeffries is, Google his name. He's one of the foremost authorities on African history and African American history. One of our Grandmaster Scholar Warriors, former chair of the um, uh, Black Studies Department at City College in New York. And we were talking about how, look, this forces a conversation about a history that Republicans are trying to pass laws to suppress. But we have to know how to use this federal holiday. It's not about a party, even though you can have a celebration, but you have to have some education and some strategizing and deal with economic empowerment and politics and history while you have your Juneteenth celebration. It can't just be a cookout with red, black and green. It can't just be a cookout with red, black and green. And that's your Juneteenth celebration. No. So let's go to this clip and then we'll continue this on the other side of the break. All right, we'll continue this on the other side of the break. We'll continue this on the other side of the break. Listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. Uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. All right. Um, stand by, everybody. Stand by. I don't think the clip was playing on this end.
Stand by. We're back from break in uh, three minutes, and we'll um, play the uh, interview from the beginning. Stand by. All right. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcasting on social media platforms. We've got uh, we've got Becky, Cynthia, SB. Zara. Got Zara Love. Okay, who still needs to register for our new Sunday uh, class that starts up Sunday, July 4th? Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa understand the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. We'll post a link here again for the course. 910. The Superstation, Detroit's only African American talk radio. Welcome back to the African History Network show, right here on 9 10 a.m. The Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Sunday, June 27th, 2021, and we are live. Um, right before the break, I was talking a little bit about Juneteenth and Juneteenth history. And uh, I was sharing a interview that uh, Angela Matthews of Urban Interest did with me on Friday, July 18th. OK, I was in Atlanta and uh, she was in Detroit. So we did an interview through Zoom. We've been re-airing this interview on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, the African History Network. I want to go back. We're going to start this uh, interview from the beginning. We'll go back to this uh, press play. Listen, I'm so excited because there is something that's happening that we have been pushing for for a long time. A federal holiday of Juneteenth. We've been celebrating and everyone is up in arms and so are we. So we have a special guest with us, Mr. Michael Emoti. He is the founder of the African History Network and he is also a talk show host, a researcher, a lecturer, and a writer. He has... Um, hosted national radio shows such as the Warren Valentine Show and yes, come on now, the Roland Martin Show, talk about big time. He is an avid writer and his articles can be read at the African History Network.com and it's also his articles can be are published by, excuse me, yourblackworld.net, culturecritic.com, financialjuneteenth.com and Blackbeans.com. So come on here, Mr. Michael, because I'm excited about this. Let's okay. Talk. All right. How you doing today, Angela? I am doing absolutely wonderful. You know, President Biden signed that legislation making right. your annual holiday. And so House Majority Whip Jim Claiborne says that that was important. So explain to us the Juneteenth flag. You said the Juneteenth flag? The Juneteenth flag, isn't it? Right, right, right. Well, the Ju Juneteenth flag is a variation of the uh, uh, of the U.S. flag. So it's to uh, recognize that, um, you know, in 1776, 4th of July, July 4th, 1776, when the uh, Declaration of Independence was signed uh, by the first four of 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, the majority of African Americans were still enslaved. So this is uh, designed for us to have something of our own. Uh, and it's red, black, and green as well, which are the colors of the uh, Pan-African flag, um, which is was created by uh, Marcus Garvey and the Universal Negro Improvement Association. It was adopted uh, in August of 1920 at their international convention. Uh, more importantly than the flag is to understand Juneteenth and the history behind Juneteenth. 
And, and we have to correct the history, but also protect the history of Juneteenth because it's going to be commodified and we have to get out in front of that and shut this down. Walmart and these other stores should not be selling Juneteenth uh, uh, merchandise because African-Americans have been selling, celebrating Juneteenth since 1866 in various ways. And African-Americans have been selling that merchandise. OK, so uh, Juneteenth, 1865, June 19th, 1865, commemorates when Major General Gordon Granger delivers uh, what's known as General Order Number 3 to enslaved Africans in uh, Galveston, Texas. All right. He arrived the day before. He arrives with about 2,000 troops. The majority of them are African-American troops. And they are enforcing the Emancipation Proclamation uh, from January 1st, 1863. Uh, the war is for all practical, practical purposes over now, it ends basically April uh, 1865 when General Robert E. Lee surrenders to uh, General Ulysses S. Grant. But Texas is more removed from the war. Major battles don't take place in Texas. You have slave owners who flee other Confederate states and go into Texas and take their slaves with them. So Texas is more more removed, and they had, got, had not gotten the news that uh, the war was over and the slaves were free. Now, the Emancipation Proclamation did not free the enslaved Africans, January 1st, 1863. This is why we have to correct the history. because There's a lot of misinformation floating around in media, especially white-owned media, dealing with it. When you, read, when you go to LOC.gov, which is the Library of Congress website, or archives.gov, which is the National Archives, and you actually read the Emancipation Proclamation. It was a military strategy from Lincoln, President Lincoln, and it states that the, the slaves in territories or states in rebellion are free as of January 1st, 1863. But slaves that are still in the border states, Maryland, Kentucky, Missouri, Delaware, they're still slaves. Slaves who were in uh, territories that had succeeded from the Union but came back under Union control, they're still slaves. The Emancipation Proclamation did not free the enslaved Africans. Okay, it's going to be the sixth. It's going to be the Thirteenth Amendment ratified December sixth, eighteen sixty five, with Georgia ratifying it. That's what's going to legally free the slaves. All right, so we can commemorate June nineteenth when the majority of those Africans in uh, Galveston got the message, and they're going through different parts of Texas delivering this message. Okay, there's two hundred fifty thousand enslaved Africans in Texas at the time. They're going through different parts of Texas. That they're going to continue to deliver the message the next day to different parts of Texas. So June 19th was a date that was settled on to commemorate this. Okay, but we have to get the history straight with this. All right. <laughs> now, I'm glad that you are um, a historian because I've heard some different variations of it as well. And so, what, what were the different variations that you heard? Well, that um, basically not that, that there was there were slaves who were still enslaved that everyone became free. And so when and well, everyone became free when? In nineteen in eighteen sixty five. So well, well uh when they so as as the Union troops are going through different areas of the Confederacy, taking back control of, of those lands, they're enforcing the Emancipation Proclamation. But this is a proclamation. They have to change the 13th. They have to change the Constitution. They have to amend the Constitution for slaves to legally be free because the Constitution sanctions slavery. Article 4, Section 2 of the U.S. Constitution laid the foundation for the Fugitive Slave Acts of 1793 and 1850. Okay. Um, so, so they have to amend the Constitution with the 13th Amendment. And then the 14th Amendment gives uh, citizenship rights to uh, African-Americans, then the 15th Amendment of 1870 guarantees the right to vote to African-American men. Doesn't apply to women at this time, but African-American men. So uh, you're going through a process. You're going through a process of these territories being brought back into the Union, brought back under Union control. And these various states have to then vote, or their state legislatures have to then vote to ratify the 13th Amendment as well. That's, that's part of the ratification process or the process to amend the U.S. Constitution. Okay? To amend the U.S. Constitution, um, a bill has to, 
pass both the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate by a two-thirds majority vote, then it has to be ratified by three-quarters of the state legislatures by a two-thirds majority vote. All right, so this part of, part of that ratification process as well for the 13th Amendment. So we can commemorate uh, uh, June 19, 1865, but we have to understand the real history. And then um, Juneteenth connects us to voting rights, it connects us to the voter suppression tactics that take place after the 15th Amendment is ratified. It connects us to, in Texas, Texas the Texas State Constitution of 1866, which has a purity of the ballot box clause in it, which it, which leads to what are known as all-white primaries, like the all-white primaries in 1918. It connects us to the Mississippi State Constitution of 1890 where they voted to institute poll taxes and literacy tests. So it connects us to voting rights, it connects us to reparations, repairing the damage of slavery and the legacy of slavery, because when uh, the, the emancipation takes place, when Africans are free, we're free largely without reparations, without giving land, giving tools, giving uh, money, anything like that, and 40 acres and a mule, special field order number 15, that land is largely gonna be taken back by President Andrew Johnson who succeeds Lincoln after Lincoln's assassinated in April of 1865, and he's going to give all that land back to the Confederacy for the most part, okay? So all of this is because so people want to talk about reparations. Juneteenth is directly related to reparations. You're talking about the legacy of slavery. You're talking about what happened during Reconstruction, 1865 to 1877. So these two are inter they interconnect. So, Mr. Michael, you have given us... <laughs> a feral history lesson about, I don't know, maybe five to seven minutes, maybe 10, but it's information that we definitely should, we should know. Absolutely. A bill that passed unanimously in the Senate, however, there were 14 Republican lawmakers. Mm -hmm. That doesn't surprise me. That doesn't surprise me. You're dealing with the, you're dealing with the white nationalist party. You're dealing with the party that, that, that many of them support the insurrections. You had 147 Republican traitors who voted not to certify the 2020 presidential election, okay, uh, on January 6th. You had 147 who voted. The, now, it's important for people to watch what's taking place. Go to govtrack.us, govtrack.us. You can track these bills in Congress, and you can see who supports them. Go to congress.gov and read these bills, okay, congress.gov and read the bills. The George Floyd Justice and Policing Act passed the House of Representatives March 3rd, 2021, by voting 220 to 212. 212 Republicans voted no on the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act after they sat there and cried and talked about how wrong it was what happened to George Floyd. No Republicans voted for the bill. The $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan. No Republicans in the House of Representatives or the U.S. Senate voted for the bill. H.R. 40 is in the House of Representatives right now. It passed out of the House Judiciary Committee two or three months ago for the first time in 32 years, originally introduced by uh, the Honorable John Conyers from the 13th Congressional District. Now is sponsored by Representative Sheila Jackson Lee of Texas, who also is the one who sponsored the Juneteenth bill from Texas, because this deals with Texas. Reparations and Juneteenth are interconnected. Anybody that lies to you and tells you they're not, they don't know what they're talking about. A hundred, uh, it's about 188 uh, members of the House of Representatives then that have signed on to support H.R. 40. None of them are Republicans. None of them are Republicans. So we can see the we can see the ideology of the party. So of the Republican Party, the GOP. So I'm neither Democrat nor Republican, but I sure as hell ain't stupid. I can see who consistently supports bills that benefit African Americans, and I can see who consistently vote against those bills and are obstructionists to those bills. So. Uh, yeah, I'm not surprised it was 14. I, I'm surprised it, was, it wasn't more than 14, to tell you the truth. So, Michael, what you have said is definitely true with regard. I, I say we need to stay woke. I think we're sleeping a little bit. I think we've gotten a little bit comfortable with what's happening and what's going on because we know that there's over 90 voter suppression bills and or has been passed that's trying to make it harder for us to vote in the upcoming year. It's close to 400. It's close to 448 state legislatures that are being pushed by Republicans. It's close to 400 bills. It's about, about, last count was about 381 bills in 48 state legislatures. See, we, we don't understand the white backlash that always comes after periods of uh, perceived gains by African Americans. Uh, the end of Reconstruction, 1877, with Rutherford, Rutherford B. Hayes becoming uh, the Republican candidate for president. 
become a president. And the Republicans agreed with the, uh, they agreed to compromise with the Democrats and remove the Union troops out of the South that were largely enforcing the rights of African Americans. And this is what ends Reconstruction. You see a backlash to the civil rights movement with the election of Richard Nixon, okay, and, and, and who ran on the platform of law and order. You see a backlash to two terms of President Barack Obama with the uh, election of Donald Trump, who ran on the platform of law and order. You see uh, a backlash with the attack on critical race theory in the attack of the 1619 Project, which was a backlash to the summer of 2020 and the Black Lives Matter protests and the protests over George Floyd. All this, this is always a backlash, okay? And and we see this, and then, and then, and then they attack you, usually not in the streets, they attack you in the courts and they attack you in the legislatures because they're dealing with law. Many of us don't understand law. We don't understand how to perceive these attacks coming. As you can see, I knew it was coming. And we don't understand how to defend against these attacks. We have to understand political self-defense. All right. Um, I will I will um, agree with you on this. We can go into this um, a little bit further. However, um, we're kind of wrapping up with you. So I want to bring it back to the celebration of this particular moment. So yeah. how we celebrate, African American families celebrate this mon monumental time. And are there any events in the area that you can share with our audience? Well, well there, there are events taking place all, all over uh, Detroit. I'm actually in Atlanta right now because I'm here for the three day Juneteenth Festival in Atlanta. And I'll be speaking there Saturday and Sunday at the Centennial Olympic Park. Uh, but you can probably Google Juneteenth Detroit. There are celebrations taking place. This is a time for us to study the history, not, commem not just commemorate those enslaved Africans getting the message. And it's also very important to understand some slave owners in Texas kept the message away from slaves and kept them enslaved for an additional year. One of them was a white woman named Martha Gibbs because the, the involvement of white women in, in slavery is much greater than we thought. Professor Stephanie E. Jones Rogers in her book in uh, 2019, I think it was, or 2018 called, they, they were her property, detailed this. Uh, from 18, 1850 and 1860, uh, about 40 percent of slave owners were white women. OK, so we need to come together as family, commemorate what happened in 1865, study the history, correct the history, use that as a foundation to give us our values and interests and our principles, use that to empower ourselves economically and politically. So this is a very, very important time and continue to push for reparations. We have to leverage this to push to repair the damage, to push to get these other bills passed through Congress as well. All right. We're going to drop the mic right there because I think... All right. And visit my website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com also. Okay. Say it again because I don't want to overtalk you. Oh, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All right. Thank you so much for being Thanks, here. Thanks, Appreciate you. And hey, success on that speech on tomorrow. Okay, thank you. All right. OK, so that was Angela Matthews of Urban Interest interviewing <laughs> yours truly. Um, that was from June 18th, 2021, dealing with the Juneteenth federal holiday. Now, as I was playing, I was showing some articles and I was showing this article here from Politico.com. Because I, I hear a whole lot of people talking about reparations. Then I ask them, explain to me how many votes it takes to get a bill passed in the house of representatives and they can't tell me i hear crickets then i ask them tell me how many votes it takes to get a bill passed in the u.s senate they can't tell me i asked this question about 50 people in atlanta when i was speaking nobody could tell me one person said a majority well uh, yeah it takes a majority but in the senate for most bills you need at least 60 votes there's only 50 Republicans. I mean, there's only 50 Democrats. That means you need 10 Republicans to vote for the bill. You do realize in the U.S. Senate, for everybody, so this is why when people say reparations now, my response is reparations how? Explain to me how do you get it? You do realize you need 10 Republicans in the U.S. Senate to vote for any reparations bill, including H.R. 40, which is to study reparations and the impact slavery and Jim Crow segregation and what happened after slavery has had on African-Americans and to make recommendations. You need 10 Republicans to vote for that. Where are you going to get them from? I mean. The black Republican Senator Tim Scott has already said he's not voting for reparations. If the black Republicans not going to vote for it, how many white Republicans you think going to vote for it in the Senate? 
Keep in mind, no Republicans in the Senate voted for the American Rescue Plan, and that was going to help white people that put them in office. So th this article here, now Biden is saying the same thing that I've been saying for months. The votes don't exist in the Senate. When I had Cam Howard right here on this show, National Male Co-Chair of NCOBRA, National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America. And we talked about, uh, I had him on before the hearing took place in the House Judiciary Committee, where H.R. 40 passed out of the House Judiciary Committee for the first time in 32 years. That was about April of this year, something like that. And we, and we talked about it. And he said that after it passes out of the House Judiciary Committee, then it has to go for a full vote on the floor. He said it's it, um, I think he said maybe they had about 180 sponsors or something like that. The article from Politico.com says there's 188 co-sponsors in the House of Representatives, 188 co-sponsors, 188 members of the House have signed on to support H.R. 40. OK, I'll show you that in just a minute, because as we as the interview was playing, I was going through showing you all. And it's actually 190 have signed on now. They're all Democrats, no Republicans in the House of Representatives, including the two black Republicans, Burgess Owens, former football player out of Utah. Now, he may not have chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE, but he sure acts like he does. Burgess Owens testified at two hearings in the House of Representatives regarding reparations. He testified against reparations. He said black people don't need reparations. This is Burgess Owens. You think he's going to vote for it? Then Representative Donalds out of Florida, uh, Brian Donalds, I think it is. He was interviewed by... Um, Roland Martin and Roland Martin unfiltered all the bills that African Americans are advocating for. He's not, he doesn't support. He either voted against them or will vote against them. Now he voted for Juneteenth, but he said he ain't voting for HR 40. He's not voting for the George Floyd justice and policing act. He voted not to certify the 2020 presidential elections. Okay. He voted against the American rescue plan. 1.9 trillion dollar American rescue plan. That's going to help white people in Florida that voted for his ignorant ass. All the, all the bills African Americans are for he's against. I went to his Twitter page. I said, you know, I'm listening to this dude. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's married to a white woman. I called it. I, I could listen to what he was saying. I called it. I went to his Twitter page. Whoop, right there. Whoop, there it is. So it, Biden is telling. So, so read this article here. This is the same thing I've been saying on this show for months. It's a math game. We don't understand math. Biden privacy, privately tells lawmakers not to expect much on reparations legislation. Why? He's talking about the Senate. He's saying the votes don't exist in the Senate. What the hell? That's what I've been telling you. This, this is exactly what I've been saying. Show me 10 Republicans in the Senate that are going to vote for reparations. They don't exist. So what does this mean? This means you have to vote more people into Congress, into the House of Representatives in the U.S. Senate who support reparations and vote people out who don't support reparations. It's a math game. We created math but don't understand math. Then it goes through and it talks about read this full article here. Because I told you, I'm going to tell you the truth about reparations. I ain't going to lie to you. There's a lot of people trying to hustle a lot of people on reparations. Make them think they're about to get a check at the end of the month. No, you're not. I told you this. We have to understand the process. We understand the process. There's 188 co-sponsors. Now it's 190 because I just checked that where? Congress.gov. That's where you go to check this stuff. That's where you go to read the bills and you can see who sponsored the bills. Now it's 190 sponsors. They're all Democrats. No Republicans in the House support this. No, Repu I can tell you right now, no Republicans in the Senate going to vote for this. Now, when I had Cam Howard here on the show, Cam was honest. Cam said, look, we're closer than ever in the House, but we still got to get it passed. We still don't have two. It takes 218 votes in the House to get it passed. He said, we, we, we have to get to 218. He said in the Senate is an uphill battle. He was honest. He said in the Senate is an uphill battle. <laughs> yes, it is. It ain't happening in the 117th Congress. The earliest you're going to get a reparate, any reparations bill passed in the Senate is going to be 2023. That's after the 2022 midterm election because you're not going to get 10 votes uh, uh, from Republicans uh, for a reparations bill, period. Now, you can hallucinate a reality that don't exist if you want to. I'm not going to lie to you. I'll tell you the truth. All right, so read this full article here, okay? And stop dealing with simple Simon ass nonsense on social media for people who have no clue what they're talking about, who are not going to be honest and, and deal with the facts with you. So uh, I, I showed you all that, and we dealt with co congress.gov, all that stuff, right? Now, 
uh, Juneteenth flag. There was one with the red, black, and green and all that. This is, but there's an official Juneteenth flag. Uh, CNN has an article uh, dealing with this. Now, this one here, I don't see a whole lot. And when I was in Atlanta, I didn't see this Juneteenth flag. This is probably popular in Texas where Juneteenth started. The Juneteenth flag is full of symbols. Here's what they mean. Read this full article because I don't have time to get deep through this. But just to highlight, the flag is the brainchild of activist Ben Heith, uh, founder of the uh, of the National Juneteenth Celebration Foundation, NJCF, NJCF, National Juneteenth uh, Celebration Foundation. Heist created the flag in 1997 with the help of collaborators and Boston based illustrator Lisa Jean Graff uh, brought their vision to life. OK, the flag was revised in the year 2000 into the version we know today, according to the National Juneteenth Observation Foundation. Seven years later, uh, the date, quote, June 19th, 1865, was added to the flag commemorating the day Union Major General Gordon Granger rode in the gallows in Texas and told enslaved Africans uh, uh, of their emancipation. Uh, so very quickly, so the star, you see, a, so if you look at the flag, you see a star, you see a starburst, and you see the, the whole, the flag is red, white, and blue. So when we look at the star, what does the star symbolize? Um, the white star, uh, the white star in the center of the flag has a dual meaning, uh, Haith said. Uh, for one, it represents Texas, the Lone Star State. It was in Galveston in 1865 where Union soldiers informed the country's remaining enslaved Africans that under emancipation uh, issued two years earlier, they were free. OK, now um, they're going to continue to deliver that message even the next day. There's about 250,000 enslaved Africans in Texas alone. Like I said, some of some are not going to be free to the next season the next year to 1866. But the star also goes beyond Texas representing the freedom of African-Americans in all 50 states. The, the, the star burst surrounding the star, the bursting outline around the star is inspired by a nova, a term that astronomers use to mean a new star. On the Juneteenth flag, uh, this represents a new beginning for the African-Americans of Galveston, Texas and throughout the land. And then you see an arc, the arc, the curve extends across the width of the flag represents, represents a new horizon, the opportunities and promise that lay ahead for African-Americans. The colors, red, white, and blue. The red, white, and blue represents the American flag, a reminder that slaves and their descendants uh, we uh, were and are Americans. Now, if you read uh, the first Americans were Africans documented evidence by Dr. David M. Hotel, we know that the original Americans were African people. We know the original Americans were African people, number one, Number two, if you look at the 1828 Noah Webster Dictionary and you look at the word American, we know that the term American originally applied to the aboriginal and copper colored races of the Americas. And this is who the Europeans refer to. This is who this is what the Europeans refer to them as Americans. Originally, the term American did not refer to white people. It referred to African people and and Native Americans in the Americas when white people found them. So African people are the original Americans. We have to understand the history. And like I said, we were in this land tens of thousands of years before Native Americans came into existence. These are things that I, that I deal with in my online course. This is why I have Dr. David M. Hotel, who wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. This is why I have him come speak to the class. We have to get the history straight. We didn't, we, we, our history didn't start here in 1619. That's an insult to African people to, 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 to lie to us and teach us that our history started in this country, 1619. Yes, 1619 in Virginia did happen. Yes, the white line pirate ship happened. And those Africans from Angola were captured by the Portuguese, about 350 of them. And then they're going to be hijacked around Veracruz, Mexico by uh, English pirates. And they're going to be put on two English pirate ships, the white line and the treasurer. And they come into Virginia. Yeah, that happened. But, but what about tens of thousands of years of history before that happened? This is what we have to understand. So we have to do with a chronology of history. So, so we got uh, this here. Uh, the red, white, and blue represents the American flag, a reminder that slaves and their descendants were and are Americans. Well, we're the original Americans. Let's keep it 100. We are the original Americans. June 19th, 1865 represents the day enslaved people. Okay. Uh, people in Galveston became Americans under law. That's not true. You need a 13th Amendment 
to to change to amend the constitution that's false right there this is why the history has to be corrected in i'm looking at this incorrect history in white control media okay this yeah you had the emancipation proclamation but under the u.s constitution the u.s constitution still sanctions slavery you had the it's not till december 6 1865 that the constitution is ratified and it's adopted december 18 1865. all right read so read this here um the juneteenth flag is full of symbols here's what they mean okay cnn.com there's other information you can read about that uh but that's something that um i could put my hands on quickly now read this here from congress.gov then what hr 40 you can read what hr 40 is okay it's more than just a study it's also dealing with recommendations and understanding the impact of slavery and a legacy of slavery okay read the co-sponsors check and see if your member of congress has has signed on the co-sponsor if not call them and ask why why not uh now let's it, it, there's a piece from time.com uh time.com and uh, also uh my lecture dealing with the um history of juneteenth is available at our website africanhistorynetwork.com africanhistorynetwork.com we have it in digital download format and dvd format it's right on the home page of our website it's a two hour is two two hours and 29 minutes i was trying to keep it to two minutes and two hours and 30 minutes end up two hours 29 minutes so uh, doing pretty good juneteenth juneteenth history emancipation day but not independence day we never got our 40 acres in the mule dr king's poor people's campaign we ca we're coming to get our check this i did this june 16th 2021 is in digital download format and dvd it's available right now at africanhistorynetwork.com it's um it's right on the home page if you register for the online course that we have starting up uh sunday july 4th you'll get this digital download of this lecture free if you register for the uh my online course that's starting up sunday july 4th you'll get a digital download of this lecture for free now a lot of people are, are saying oh we ain't asked for a juneteenth holiday blah 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 i'm not sure when you took a poll i'm not sure how much of, of the history of juneteenth you've actually studied but that's false also the fight to make juneteenth a federal holiday dates back to the 1960s so let's look at this article here from time.com time magazine i think i have a subscription to time i have so many subscriptions i think i think they forced me to get a subscription so um that's one reason why I use New York Times, Washington Post so much because I, I pay them each month. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I monitor about 35 different news sources on a daily basis, but some of them I have to pay. <laughs> why is it post New York Times? One of them, I think I, I think I paid time.com also. I just have so many subscriptions. Activists are put now. This is from 2020. This article here is from June 6. This is from June 17th, 2020. That's when this article originally came out. OK, because they tried to get Juneteenth passed in the Senate in uh, 2020. Activists are pushing to make Juneteenth a national holiday. Here's the history behind the fight. All these all these dumbass memes floating around. They don't tell you this history. Most likely because the people that make the memes don't know the history. First question I ask is, do these people live in the United States of America? OK, now, if we look at this piece here, uh, I want to scroll down. The movement to make Juneteenth a national holiday in the 1960s, the civil rights movement brought a new push. Civil rights movement brought a new put. The civil rights movement brought a new push for America to live up to those ideas. And with it came a renewed awareness of Juneteenth. One turning point in awareness came in the aftermath of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He assassinated April 4th, 1968. At the time of his death, much of Dr. King's work focused on economic justice. At the time of his death, mu much of Dr. King's work focused on uh, economic justice. OK, now he ain't just come to the realization that we need economic justice. That means you haven't read his books. He wrote five books. OK, now um, he was focused on economic justice and he was in the middle of planning a poor people's campaign march for the coming months. After he was assassinated, the work went on, including a uh, including via a Solidarity Day rally held in Washington, D.C. that Juneteenth. Organized by uh, Dr. King's disciple, Ralph Abernathy, 
the rally, which boasted more than 50,000 participants, capped off about six weeks during which activists lived in an encampment encampment called Resurrection City to raise awareness of inequality. Uh, Wiggins believes that the success of the rally helped inspire participants to host Juneteenth celebrations in their own communities in the years and decades that followed. It was during this period that the modern effort to make Juneteenth a national holiday developed. You're talking about the late 1960s. It was during this period that the modern that the modern effort to make Juneteenth a national holiday developed amid a widespread push to raise awareness of black history. Many felt that the American calendar ought to reflect the past. The fight over a national Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, which would first be celebrated in 1986, was underway. And some felt that Juneteenth was also a crucial part of the story. You talking about 1986. People ain't just start fighting for Juneteenth. Opal. Now, Opal Lee has been fighting for years, 94 years old, member of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. People ain't just start fighting to make Juneteenth a federal holiday. Some people, just, some African-Americans just found about Juneteenth last year. Let's just be honest. So they think it's something new. No, it's not. Thanks to the efforts of state representative Al Edwards, known as Mr. Juneteenth, Texas became the first state to make Juneteenth a state holiday in 1980. Al Edwards died uh, in April of 2020. Okay, those watching on Facebook and YouTube, uh, keep watching. We're going to keep broadcasting for a few more minutes. Also, if you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. We're here six days a week. This helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting. Remember, right now, it's correct, wrong behavior. It's not over till we win Wakanda forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow night. Peace. All right, stand by, everybody. Stand by. Hold on. Stand by. Let's continue. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on your social media platform. You won't find this type of information many other places. If you like this type of information, you'll definitely be blown away by the online course that I teach, the 10 week online course that I teach. All right. So, this is our actual Cash App. Uh, tag dollar sign the AHN show S H O W, and it shows it'll show my name there, Michael, and show my picture. These other ones are fake African History Network Cash App accounts that somebody posted. I already already reported them to Cash App. That's not us, okay? They've been stealing money from us. That's not us. All right, let's continue here. So this helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting six days a week, pay some of the bills as well. Oh, let me uh get to and from uh atlanta also because i had to pay my way to and from atlanta uh even though i was speaking there let's see here juneteenth okay let's go okay let's go back to this here let's go back to this history with juneteenth we have to correct the history and we have to protect the history we have to correct the history and we have to protect the history all right now uh, one of the time.com. Let me go back to this here. So in 1994, a group of ministers in uh, New Orleans founded the National Juneteenth Observance Foundation, the National Juneteenth Observance Observance Foundation in the wake of a period of uproar over police brutality that echoes today. Around that time, it was being reported that the majority of police brutality complaints in the U.S. were directed at New Orleans per a draft of a 1992 Department of Justice study. OK, 1992, as Reverend John Mosley, one of the co-founders, tells Time magazine, quote, we were inspired by the horrific incidents such as the videotaped beating of Rodney King and the mistreatment of black people by police in New Orleans and others around the country, end quote. We were inspired by the uh, horrific incidents such as the beating of Rodney King, the videotape beating of Rodney King, and the mistreatment of black people by police in New Orleans and others around the country. Now, does this, does, does this sound like shucking and jiving? Does this, does this sound... 
that, I mean, it helps if you do a Google research. It helps if you do like a five minute Google search. Today, every state except North Dakota. Now, this is this article is from June 2020. Today, every state except North Dakota, South Dakota, and Hawaii has some sort of Juneteenth observance, according to the National Juneteenth Observance Foundation. Over the last 25 years, the group has developed a network of organizers in, in each state and advocates that Congress made uh, over the last 25 years. The group has developed a network of organizers in each state and advocates that Congress made Juneteenth a national observance. Like Flag Day or an official federal holiday like Thanksgiving. This is over the last 25 years. People didn't just start pushing for Juneteenth to become a federal holiday in 2020 or this year. Who's making these dumbass memes? Why don't they cite any sources for their research? But this fight goes back to the late 1960s after Dr. King was assassinated and the Poor People's Campaign continues until the 1970s. This isn't new. It's just new to you. This isn't new. To help promote the holiday, the group created a Juneteenth flag with the broad red stripe to represent the blood black people shared to create the country and a white star over the blue horizon guiding them towards freedom in the future. Quote, we wanted to use June to not everybody. Somebody need to make a meme out of this. I mean, uh, somebody make a meme out of this right here. Quote, we wanted to use Juneteenth to call attention to the world that things are not right. And black people are people too. And we want equal treatment for being people too. End quote, Mosley says. Quote, it was not just to have a party and have a good time. It's a rallying cry for us, end quote. It's not just to party and have a good time. It's a rallying cry for us. Now, Cliff Robinson, who in 1997 started the website Juneteenth.com as a clearinghouse for information on Juneteenth celebrations, says that the growth of the Internet in the 1990s and social media in the 2000s has made Americans much more aware of the holiday. Its history became part of the national conversation when Ralph Ellison's uh, posthumously published second novel entitled Juneteenth, with a key plot point, with a key plot point occurring during a Juneteenth celebration, came out ahead of the holiday in 1999. Certain TV shows like Blackish and Atlanta have run Juneteenth episodes, too. But Cliff Robinson says nothing so far generated momentum for the holiday the way news of the Trump rally did in 2020 when Trump was going to have a rally um, in uh, in 2020 uh, around Juneteenth. Then Trump claimed he claimed credit for making Juneteenth popular. It was already popular. Now, some more people found out because just of all the media talk and this was during the pandemic so you at the same time you have the social justice movement that's exploding and the protests in the streets surrounding the killing of george floyd and ahmaud arbery and brianna taylor and people are at home during the, the during the stay at home order so they're watching tv or they're out in the streets protesting opal lee of fort worth texas the 93 oh she's 94 years old now juneteenth advocate advocate who started Make Juneteenth a national holiday in 2020 petition on change.org says the coronavirus stay at home orders have allowed time for the significance of the protests and Juneteenth to finally sink in. She said, quote, I hate to say the pandemic helped, but people have had people have had to stay home and they are doing thinking and noticing that they didn't have time to do. Read the rest of this article. I just want to give you some background information. Because I see people circulating a whole bunch of nonsense that can easily be proven false with a five minute Google search. Read this article here. This is from June 2020. Activists are pushing to make Juneteenth a national holiday. Here's the history behind the fight. This fight goes back decades. They ain't just. Come on. Come on. If you don't know, just say so. So read this article here. 
now we're almost out of time here we're gonna we're, this dealing with Oregon banning black people we're gonna deal with this a few minutes here and we're gonna continue this on my Monday show okay because we had a lot to cover here and and there was like two or three there was like at least two other stories I wanted to cover on on today's show but I said you know what I said knowing me this is gonna be enough okay and yeah I was right because <laughs> I got some other stuff for Monday all right I was gonna do it today but I said no nah, this is gonna be too much okay remember uh, MC Hammer uh, remember that song please Hammer don't hurt I said okay <laughs> this is so I said that'd be too much for him we had to do this uh on Monday show uh June 26th I saw this from EJI.org. I've read this information before. We're going to talk about it briefly here, and we'll continue this on Monday's show. Did you know in Oregon, you ever wonder why Oregon is one of the whitest states in the country? Well, there's a reason for that. It wasn't just by accident. On June 26, 1844, the Oregon Territory banned free African Americans. See, when we deal with a history of slavery, and we deal with repairing the damage. This is why study is necessary. One, because Americans are very ignorant of history. That's not attacking Americans. I'm just saying it's the educational system. Americans are very ignorant of history. So America must have a massive history lesson. And when you deal with things like, um, let me see here. Uh, there was the one from, um, well, one, you know, we talked about this story here how um, almost 60% of Americans know little or nothing about Juneteenth. Okay, we talked about that early in the week. So if they don't know about Juneteenth, how much do they know about the history of slavery? This is from the New York Times, okay? This article here from June 16, 2021. Most Americans know little or nothing about Juneteenth poll finds. Uh, uh, MSNBC put it at 62% of Americans know little or nothing about Juneteenth. So if they don't know about Juneteenth, which deals with the history of slavery, then how much, how much do they really know about slavery? Then you have, um, you have, uh, there was an article, the other one I was looking for, the one I was really looking for, is dealing with uh, the U.S. Constitution. We talked about this from um, um, CBS this morning, January 19th, 2021. And this, this deals with how most Americans don't know what's in the U.S. Constitution. Well, the U.S. Constitution ties to history. It's not separate from history. That's at the Philadelphia Convention, 1787. Read this one here, and there's a video in it. We shared it. We shared the video here on our uh, on our show. Um, up here. Most Americans don't know what's in the Constitution. A crisis of civic ed education. A good portion of them voted for Donald Trump. January 19th, 2021. Most Americans don't know what's in the in the in the Constitution, a crisis of civic education. This ties to history. This is directly related to history. Um, let me see here. OK, so read that article. We talked about this here on the show. There's a there's a, a video in here to watch from uh, CBS this morning that breaks this down. They go out on the street and ask people things like how many members of the House of Representatives are there? Who's the chief justice of the U.S. Supreme Court? All these things. Most people can't even ask these questions. These are people that vote. Most of them can't answer these questions. How much you think they know about the history of slavery and what happened after slavery when you try to repair the damage? So let, let me ask you this question here. Right. It, when the election time takes place or when the bills, uh, even if it's not election time, say, for instance, uh, you have a judge that's coming up for a nomination for the U.S. Supreme Court. You know, you'll see after you see political ads on TV saying, call your member of the Senate, tell them vote to approve this judge. Call your member of the Senate, say no on this judge. Right. I've seen that with Supreme Court judges. When you have local elections. Or it could be a bill in the House of Representatives or the Senate. And they'll say, vote, vote yes on proposal A. Proposal A will do one, two, three, four, five. Vote no on proposal B. Proposal B is bad. 
vote no on proposal b proposal b will do this 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 is bad for the city this is bad for america right we see political ads how many ads have you seen for hr 40 political ads are designed to do what educate people give them 30 seconds 60 seconds about what's in the bill why they should vote for it why they shouldn't vote for it to educate tell the platform inform give a call to action pick up the phone call your person call your member of congress etc today tell them vote for this don't vote for that go to this website research more blah 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 how many ads have you seen for hr 40. hopefully we'll see some soon because america has to have a massive history lesson and you use media to educate people and shape the way people think feel act and behave how many how many commercials have you seen for reparations how many commercials have you seen for hr 40 hopefully we'll see some soon all right so this one here oregon territory bans free black people on june 26 1844 the legislative committee of the territory then known as oregon county this is before oregon becomes a state in the union on june 26 1844 the legislative committee of the territory then known as oregon county passed the first of a series of black exclusion laws these were called black exclusion laws the law dictated that free African Americans were prohibited from moving into Oregon County. Prohibited from moving into Oregon County, and those who violated the ban could be whipped not less than 20, no more than 39 stripes or lashes. If they violated the ban, they could be whipped. This is in 1844. Now, that December, December 1844, the law was amended to substitute forced labor for whipping i guess they developed some type of moral compass they said well, don't whip them just work them that december 1844 the law was amended to substitute forced labor for whipping it specified that african americans who stayed within oregon would be hired at a public auction and that the and that the hirer would be responsible for removing the hiree out of the territory after the prescribed period of forced service was rendered. This law was enforced even though slavery and involuntary servitude were illegal in Oregon County. So they banned free African Americans. Okay. They didn't have slavery, but they, but they're going to have forced labor. <laughs> they're going to have forced labor of free African Americans. The preamble to a later exclusion law passed in 1849 explained legislatures belief, legislators belief that quote, now pay attention to this. It explained legislators belief that it would be highly dangerous to allow free Negroes and mulattoes to reside in the territory of Oregon County or to intermix with Indians instilling feelings of hostility toward the white race feeling what would what, what, what would make you think that after you ban free black people and then you say if they stay you're gonna whip them but then you have a change of heart and say we're not gonna whip them we just gonna have a public auction and sell you off for labor what would make you think that black people would have hostility towards the white race? Now, the Oregon Constitution of 1857, see, it goes back to the state constitutions, Oregon State Constitution, 1857, Texas State Constitution, 1876, Mississippi Constitution, 1890, Louisiana State Constitution, 1898, goes back to these state constitutions. The Oregon Constitution of 1857 included racial exclusion provisions against African Americans and Asian Americans. The document declared that Asian, the African Americans outside of Oregon were not permitted to, quote, come reside or be within the state. Come reside or be within the state. 
prohibited African Americans from owning property. This is also the, 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 the racial exclusion provisions of the Oregon State Constitution 1857, well, Oregon Constitution 1857, also prohibited African Americans from owning property or performing contracts and prescribed punishment for those who employed, harbored, or otherwise help African Americans. Now, between 1850 and 1860, in the midst of this exclusion and discrimination, African-Americans were never constituted, ne never constituted more than 1% of the population in the American Pacific Northwest. Between 1840 and 1860, Oregon, which joined the Union as a free state on February 14th, 1859, stands as a clear illustration that racial discrimination and oppression against African Americans was also widespread in jurisdictions where slavery was illegal. So just because they didn't have slavery didn't mean they didn't have discriminatory laws against African Americans. Oregon, which joined the Union as a free state on February 14, 1859, stands as a clear illustration that racial discrimination and oppression against African Americans was also widespread in, in jurisdictions where slavery was illegal. As of 2018, the US Census Bureau estimated that less than 3% of Oregon residents were African Americans. I want surprise, surprise, surprise. I wonder why. What could possibly cause something like that to happen? So check that out from EJI.org, Equal Justice Initiative. We'll talk some more about this on uh, Monday show because we're out of time here. We'll talk some more about this on Monday show. OK, be sure to register for the uh, online course that starts up Sunday, uh, July 4th, the 4th of July, Sunday, July 4th. Uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. This is a 10 week online course that I teach. We do with thousands of years of history. I do a visual presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips. We do it live. It'll be Sundays, uh, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All the sessions will be recorded. They'll be archived. You can go back and watch it over and over again as well. We'll post a link here. You can register for that. It's regularly $130 on sale, $80. As soon as you register, you can start watching the bonus content. Um, and then also you can support the African History Network. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App and through PayPal paypal.me forward slash the ahn show paypal.me forward slash uh the ahn show uh we have monday through friday 11 p.m to 12 midnight eastern standard time and sundays 9 p.m 11 p.m eastern standard time you can also watch the african history network show on um uh, black on purpose tv bop uh, tv dot com bop uh, tv dot com as well okay all right we have to get out of here and uh, you'll, you'll see more coming from um, uh, Black on Purpose TV uh, also. On Purpose Television Network. Yes, Black on Purpose Television Network. All black, all positive, all the time. The largest Black-owned streaming television network in the world. Bringing our people together worldwide. Controlling our messages, our story, our way. Black TV, the way it should be. Black music, black history, and more. 30 plus channels, thousands of shows. Black on Purpose Television Network, subscribe now. Gain knowledge in minutes from insightful summaries of progressive. All right. All right, we'll talk to you all tomorrow.